Welcome to the IBM Chief Data and Technology Officer Summit, the fourth in our six-part series for 2022. I'm Dr. Liliana Horn, Director of AI Accelerator, and I am delighted to have recently joined the IBM Global Chief Data Office team and to kick off today's session, Privacy Expanded. The mission of our AI Accelerator is to take the leading data and AI capabilities that we have deployed internally at a scale within IBM and bring them forward to this community and hopefully help you in your AI transformations. As regulatory requirements evolve, every organization is facing the challenge of ensuring that its data policies and practices continue to be compliant, especially related to privacy. At the same time, challenging and uncertain times are accelerating the data transformation and generating a data-driven culture faster than ever. Privacy and the protection of personal information coupled with a solid data governance framework are critical for a successful privacy policy implementation. A data governance framework makes the right quality data easier to find for those who should have access to it while allowing sensitive data to remain hidden unless appropriate. A strong privacy parameters help increase readiness for compliance and data protection anywhere, on-premises or across clouds. They also enable organizations to understand and quickly apply industry-specific regulatory policies and governance rules on data wherever it resides. Finally, Organizations that surpass compliance with new requirements build trust with consumers and users, creating a competitive advantage. In today's session, we'll be joined by chief privacy officers from some of the world's most prestigious organizations to discuss the interplay of data privacy and governance and how best practices help to ensure your enterprise is fully prepared. To start, we'll hear from Tom Mariarty, Executive Vice President, Chief Policy and External Affairs Officer, and General Counsel at CBS Health, and Indra Balbandari, IBM's Global Chief Data Officer. Please post your questions in the chat. We will be sure to get them addressed. Thank you again for joining us today, and let's get started. With that, let me turn it over to our summit partner, Dave Matheson, CEO of the CDO Club. Thank you. All right, well, thanks for that kind introduction, Liliana, and welcome back to the IBM CDO CTO Summit Series. I'm here live in San Francisco today, where we're going to be hosting our first live event in two and a half years for IBM, November 9th. So be sure to register for that. A warm welcome to you all and to our special guests today, IBM Global Chief Data Officer, Indrapal Bandari, and Tom Moriarty, Executive Vice President, Chief Policy and External Affairs Officer and General Counsel at CVS Health. Tom, there are a lot of upcoming regulations on privacy, on sustainability, and responsible tech. In your opinion, what are the big open questions in these areas, and how will you and the team help CBS Health in addressing these upcoming challenges? Now, thank you, David. It's an important question, a very timely question. There's, there's been an incredible amount of activity over the last year, year and a half, and it's only going to grow, not just at the state and federal level here in the United States, but also globally and cooperation globally amongst regulators. I recently was in Brussels for a transatlantic exchange between EU and U.S. regulators, and the level of cooperation and exchange is unprecedented in those areas. So seeing not just what's happening here, being aware of where regulators around the world are looking and how that can impact your business is going to be really important. And it has big implications for how we structure at CVS and I think it, how companies overall structure and the role of governance and data governance early on in product formation, product design. It's going to be grow, become even more important as we go forward. Fantastic. Thank you. Over to Interpol. With all these advances in artificial intelligence, uh, how can organizations automate data privacy policy enforcement? For example, auto-classify, auto-detect, auto-desensitize, etc. This is a trend that is only going to increase. We're just at the start of this innings, so it's going to intensify. It's going to be picked up in more geographical regions. These regulations actually differ by geographical region as well. So you can think of the complexity if you're operating globally and what you're gonna to have to deal with. So automation is going to be the key. 
but it's also going to be a very complicated landscape just because these uh, regulations are going to be all different. So the governance in some sense at a specific level, you know, it, it becomes multimodal. You, you can't really have just one size fits all. On the other hand, you can't possibly have a framework that you have to redesign for every different region that you're operating in, right? So you kind of need a framework that does fit across the globe, but allows you to be multimodal, allows you to essentially adapt and address the differences in the regulation. The key aspects on this, I mean, there's a concept that's now also emerging, I mean, may quite be in response to some of these regulations of the data fabric. You can think about the data fabric as primarily giving the enterprise a single pane of glass, a single you know, control point. And so it reduces the complexity of managing through all these regulations worldwide. But what are the essential elements of that single pane of glass? First and foremost, you have to have a data catalog which essentially describes and lets you know what are your data assets and where they reside in business terms so that an analyst, a business person, that they can understand what's in there. Otherwise the data goes dark and then you're not gonna be able to manage it. So that's the very first thing is to make sure that you have the catalog. The second aspect is the metadata, the descriptions, the business descriptions about the data. What is the data about? Who can use it? What are the restrictions? who's allowed access to it. These are all examples of metadata around the data. And increasingly metadata is getting more and more sophisticated. So in the context of the data fabric, you can actually think of it as an augmented knowledge graph, which kind of shows you the network of data that you have worldwide. And then also the conditions that apply to these different sets of data. Now, once you've got the metadata and the catalog, you can then start thinking about how to intelligently automate the kinds of things that you were talking about, Dave, with yep. essentially being able to tag data. So you say, okay, this is PHI. I know that because I've gone through this data. I've been able to identify PHI, and now I'm going to tag it as such. And then once you have that metadata, you're now able to then automate that, right? You're going to say, this is sensitive data, private data. I'm not going to show that when people essentially access this, unless they actually have the authority. That's the automation part. So the tagging was the metadata part, and then the automation is essentially what you decide to do. Really uh, appreciate you bringing up data fabric. Let's go back to Tom for a moment though. Tom, what are the main challenges companies face today when trying to balance innovation and new technology with risk and regulation? In Interpol hit on a lot of them. I mean, the whole concept of use for a limited and defined purpose is going to become increasingly more important to the regulators. Broad access, broad rights, that's not going to fly going forward. Limited specific use is going to be very, so the flexibility of your systems become even more important. And beyond the, the data governance and data management, which is incredibly important, I think there's going to be an important role to storytelling that has become even more important. And what I mean by that is, as transparency requirements start to take hold and there's further review, investigation, not just in the context of use, but your company may get involved in a merger. Well, the regulators are using that merger to start getting into how are you using data more broadly within the company. So understanding and telling the story of what you're doing with data, providing that transparency and having that built ahead of time is gonna allow you to navigate much better any inquiries that may come in from a regulator or even a consumer group. And I think the more proactive you are here with state attorneys general, with your regulators, you're going to be in a better position longer term. Absolutely, Tom. And uh, Interpol, you piqued my interest on, on data fabric. What are the next steps, in your opinion, for data privacy in regards to data fabric? You know, Tom brought up a number of great points that I couldn't really have summarized it better myself. Uh, the, the, that, that whole point about proactivity, engaging with the regulators, being transparent with them and making sure that they are in a position that they are comfortable with whatever you're planning to do, that goes to that whole idea about the single pane of glass. That, that's why you need to reduce the complexity. Imagine trying to explain to regulators if you've got a very complicated network, as you will have, but if you, if you have to expose that complexity to them, it, it's not going to work. So the data fabric introduces that single pane of glass. And then essentially, you've got to have a few key elements. I mentioned a couple of them in my last answer, but you, you also have to introduce other things. We talked about multimodal governance. So in a sense, 
even though these in objective, these policies will be similar or perhaps even identical, right? Preserve the privacy rights of the individual. At the highest level, everybody's trying to do that. But in terms of how it's actually enacted and what the letter of the law is, those, all those things will be very different. What you can do in Singapore, you won't be able to do in Germany and vice versa. And so you're, you're going to be able to have to explain all this to the regulators. You're also going to have to be able to enable your users in a way that's easy. Otherwise, again, you'll hit the road, you know, the, the speed bump on the innovation on all those aspects of things that you're trying to do. So self-service is going to be a key piece of this. But then again, because, you know, self-service suggests a lot of freedom. Yeah. The, the, the system, the data fabric has to be such that you are able to apply that multimodal governance. And only those people who are supposed to be accessing that data actually have access to it. You're also going to have to tie in security with privacy for the same reasons that I mentioned. You know, in some cases, yes, they might be an employee. They may not be authorized to see the data. And if they see it, that, that's bad. But what's even worse is if you have essentially a nefarious actor who comes in to steal your data. And so the security aspects have to be tied in with that data fabric. So again, it's that single pane of grass plus that will bring together the privacy and the security aspects. Then because of the complexity, the life cycle will have to be managed automatically as well of all these different components that I talked about, about the data, about the AI algorithms. That stuff has to be automated as part of your framework. Otherwise, to Tom's point, the explanation back to the regulators is going to be far too complex. So the data fabric, essentially, you can think of that as it's a response to the nature of the world as it goes to a multi-cloud hybrid environment, but yeah. also a response to these different regulations that you see propping up and increasing in intensity, not just across the data, but also across AI. Another great session. I want to thank you both so much for your time today. And now let's explore this topic more deeply with our panel with not one, not two, not three, but four female chief privacy officers from some of the world's most prestigious organizations. Now let's join the panel. Hi again, I'm David Matheson, and I'm thrilled to moderate this panel on Privacy Expanded. And I'm delighted to welcome to the program, Courtney Welton, who's Senior Vice President, General Counsel for Innovation Law and Chief Ethics, Compliance and Privacy Officer at Allstate, Welcome Susan Rohol, who's Senior Vice President and Chief Privacy Officer at Warner Brothers Discovery, Tammy Dokin, who's Chief Data Privacy Officer at the World Bank, and Christina Montgomery, Chief Privacy Officer and AI Ethics Board Chair at IBM. Welcome to the program, everyone. Well, our first question is going to go to everyone. We'll start with Courtney. Courtney, what are your top priorities for, for you and your team regarding existing or upcoming data privacy regulations? Our main focus now is we did a lot of work the last two to three years to comply with state privacy laws like California and others that were evolving across the country. And now we're really focused on how do we make sure that as new laws come in, how do we ingest those and leverage the good work we did across all of our different business units and enterprise to really build on the strategic approach that we took and allow those new laws and approaches and compliance requirements to be absorbed and think about how to do that in a way that is most enabling to the business while being compliant with law. So that's been kind of our, our main focus, but there's also some other enterprise frameworks that we've worked on as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Courtney. And Susan, over to you at Warner Brothers Discovery. What are your top priorities for you and your team? Well, we definitely are trying to do the same thing as Courtney. I think we've uh, set a global baseline and are now trying to think about how to just keep raising the bar to meet where consumer expectations are going and also to deal with developer guideline changes from Apple and Google, which are very much influencing the entire advertising ecosystem. They're changing the way companies like mm -hmm. ours are submitting apps, the types of changes we need to make to those apps. So as a consumer facing business, we have a lot that we are sort of focused on doing to be able to scale consumer changes across thousands of digital properties. As an employer, we are also dealing with the new California Privacy Rights Act, which goes into effect January 1st, 2023. We have a huge employee base in California, and so dealing with the new privacy rules that are coming to California with that law and how they impact not just our employee base, but all of the different 
people we work with, contractors, third-party vendors, our talent, B2B relationships we have, all of those consumers of, so to speak, of California privacy are now getting the same rights that were originally passed with CCPA and now are coming to CPRA. So I think those are two of our bigger challenges. Thank you. And at the World Bank, Tammy, tell us about this on a global scale. So we operate in a completely different space. We don't have consumers or typical interaction with individuals like the other colleagues here. We are a treaty-based organization comprised of 189 countries. And similar to the United Nations, we do not follow any regulation. So we have privileges and immunities, which means that we are self-regulated. So that's a blessing and a curse. So priority is to continue to stress the importance of data privacy. Of those 189 countries that are partners, most of them have data protection regulations. So we know that our stakeholders view this as very important, yet we try to offset that with our other priorities. Our two goals are to reduce extreme poverty and promote sustainability. So we fund development projects that necessarily collects information of individuals in these developing countries, and we need to do so in a way that meets our stakeholder expectations. So our priorities are to follow regulations so that we understand where stakeholder expectations are going. And then also need to reflect cultural differences. So what does somebody in a project in India expect versus somebody in a South American country versus you know, Singapore and elsewhere? So it's really an interesting space. So the consumer laws don't apply. None of that applies, but we have to be aware of it. And we also, as Susan said, you know, we have a huge employee base and self-regulate how we use our employees' data across the globe. So those are, those are two of our priorities. What are your top priorities over at IBM for upcoming data privacy regulations? So similar to a lot of others, and I think it, it's great that we have different perspectives and different businesses on this call, because we're kind of different than the Warner Brothers and the Allstates, as well as the World Banks, because we are a controller of employee data and marketing data and the like, but fundamentally we provide uh, services to other businesses, to other enterprises. So we're essentially a service provider. So we look at privacy regulations through the lens of both a controller and a service provider, but we're more on the back end of the economy. So we support 90% of the world's largest banks, 80% of the telcos, almost half, or I think the, the latest number I saw is about half of all retail transactions somehow touch IBM tech. So we're sort of supporting the background and handling a lot of personal information as a result of that, primarily for our clients who manage some of the most sensitive data in the world. So consumer laws obviously matter considerably to our clients. And of course they matter to us because we've been doing this for over a hundred years now. And that trust and responsibility is critically important to us. So our focus areas have been in all the spaces in terms of continuing to adapt and ensure resiliency in our program as privacy laws continue to get enacted around the globe fairly rapidly with short timeframes for compliance. State laws as well, like in the U.S. now, there are five state privacy laws we're following very closely as well. The proposed American Data Privacy and Protection Act, which could potentially lead to comprehensive privacy regulation in the United States for the first time. Um, but then another area which others hadn't mentioned, you know, is a tech company and a hybrid cloud and AI company we are really focused right now on the regulation around artificial intelligence and how that ends up becoming enacted around the globe today. The EU proposed the EU AI Act, which is the first global comprehensive legislative proposal. So we follow that very closely. But then if you look at privacy laws around the globe, a lot of those have provisions in them around algorithmic decision-making, regulating algorithms and that type of thing. So I'm following that very closely as well. Fascinating. Uh, thank you so much, Christina. And Courtney, how do you maintain standards and accountability for these enterprise level ethics, regulatory compliance and privacy programs and still provide regular reporting to executive management and the board? Yeah, I mean, I think I echo what a lot of, I think I'm hearing from everyone here is that it really has to be in your DNA of your company. And you have to make sure that just like you would have 20 years ago, when you think about building a great ethical culture, you need to have that ethics 
continue into the data privacy and cyberspace because you can have tons and tons of policies and procedures, but at the end of the day, there are people who are working on all of this and they need to know what they should do and be thinking about the customer. So at a high level, I would say, you know, we certainly make sure that culturally at Allstate, we're a protection company. We're in the business of really protecting people. And we feel very strongly that data privacy, identity protection, the space of a digital footprint, that is where people really want protection right now. And so we need to live and breathe that in our practices. I think Susan made a great point about how we treat our employee data. It's as important as how we treat our customer data, those third parties that we work with. Whatever the situation is, we really have to make sure that our employees are equipped with the right cultural choices and they understand what we're asking of them. You really cannot build for one law yeah. or one area. You have to build the concepts and principles within data privacy that matter to consumers and that are expected for consumers. And then from there, you can really make sure that you have the ability to be agile and adapt as you need to for different business units. I mean, we have a car sharing business. We have a telematics business. We have things that are very different than our core insurance business. And quite frankly, they have different needs. They have different risks. They have different concerns around privacy in each of those areas. So if I tried to give a one size fits all, never able to kind of move in an agile way, it really wouldn't work across our enterprise. So that's what our team has been, you know, really focused on. And we, we created innovation law to have top lawyers who can give advice in these cutting edge areas, because while we've had excellent insurance lawyers and other lawyers that you would imagine in a heavily regulated insurance financial services industry, we needed to build in lawyers who'd been in digitally mature companies like, like IBM and others. And then when you put those together with folks who've been in the regulated industry, it's kind of like pixie dust, right? They can find the right answers. They can find the right agile opportunities and ways to make sure we're doing the right thing and be able to build products and services that protect people. And Susan, what advice would you give other organizations trying to operationalize good data governance and privacy frameworks and policies? I think Courtney made a lot of really great points. And one of the things I wanna echo is privacy isn't a compliance function exclusively. I think that many, many companies have treated it as a legal issue and have hired lawyers to draft privacy policies and contract terms. I think that larger sophisticated companies doing things with data should be hiring privacy engineers. And they need to make investments in privacy through a lens of what are the systems they can build, what are the controls they can build in their back end processes and their front end consumer experiences that give consumers control over data and that allow them to actually, I mean, it's fairly basic, but many companies struggle with this, know what their data is and have the right tagging around that data so they can also leverage it for their own benefit. And this is something that I think these two concepts don't have to be at odds with each other. You can do privacy very well and also be a company that capitalizes on the first party data that you're receiving to give your consumers what they want and what they expect in terms of better customized experiences, more personalized products, faster ways of engaging with their e-commerce transactions. All of these things can fit consumer expectations and not be at odds with privacy. So I think the most important thing is that business leadership needs to think about it through that lens. And see the opportunities that privacy is presenting in the marketplace as a competitive differentiator. And, you know, depending on where you are in the ecosystem, there are many companies that are way ahead of other companies because they are, they sit on cloud architecture. They've been making conscious choices about how to build more controls into their products and services, and that's giving them a leg up. And that may not be every business, but I think a lot of them need to be sort of backing up and thinking about it through that lens versus sort of jumping from compliance effort to compliance effort, which, you know, is also very important. But I think ultimately you can't solve privacy by one law at a time. And most global businesses are really not thinking of their consumers as residents of Virginia or Utah or Connecticut right? They're thinking of them as a consumer of all of their products and services. Tammy. So I'll jump on what Susan said about a competitive advantage. So we are in competition with other multilateral development banks for the projects that we want to fund. We are approaching this as 
we believe that we are the first international organization to really embed data privacy into the work that we do. And a result of that is this competitive advantage that we're starting to be able to roll out when we're competing for projects that we hope to fund. The challenge with that is that we are the first to do this. There's no blueprint. There's no nothing I can look at or any peers that I can speak to who've done this. Not only do we not follow regulation, but we have to be very careful not to even appear to be building a program that ties to GDPR or Brazil or any other specific regulation because of the way that we're structured. We have to be very, very agnostic. Challenge number one is figuring out how to do that at the same time, as I said earlier, meeting the expectations of our stakeholders. Second challenge is our commitment to a decentralized approach. Many, many times in my three years at the bank, people have said, can't we just check the box? It's like, no, nope, we're doing this. This needs to be embedded and really throughout the organization. So we're giving everybody the tools that they need to start to think about how to embed data privacy into their work. And it's not a centralized check the box approach because we really mean what we say and we want it to be in the fabric of everything that we're doing. The third challenge is how to do this meaningfully in the extremely diverse areas that we work. So how do you provide a privacy notice when you're conducting a household survey for a tribe that does not have a language that we can communicate with? How do we do that? So we get to be very creative and figure out ways to make it meaningful and make sure that we are understanding and compassionate with individuals' expectations and uh, the information that they're giving us. And in many cases, it's it's very, very sensitive to the areas that we cover and lives are at risk if we mishandle personal data, for example, in relocation situations, immigration scenarios. So it's doing this in a way that, you know, we are reflecting the culture, reflecting the how the individual is presenting. So certainly there are more challenges, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you for all your work there. And Christine, as CPO, how do you support IBM's business objectives and growth while simultaneously ensuring all these U.S. and, and global federal state privacy compliance issues are in check in, in such a complex business environment. I think everybody, you know, Tammy, Susan, Courtney, everybody sort of hit a first point, which is, you know, there is a complex global environment. You can't just tackle each new law as it comes in whole cloth, like starting fresh from the beginning. You can't. You have to have a program that sets a baseline, which is what we do that will generally help you comply the baseline standard because you've got like 130 plus comprehensive privacy regulations around the world and we have operations in 170 countries around the world so obviously we can't just take each new law as it comes into effect for us on this point about supporting the business, it's twofold really we and I know Susan covered this a little bit in addressing the fact that it's a differentiator. So for us, trust and compliance with privacy regulations really are an objective in and of themselves. And we have a team. The team under me is an operations, essentially, team. It's not just compliance focused. It gets advice and counsel from privacy legal, but we're operations people, fundamentally. Technology people, the privacy engineering team is dedicated to work in support of our privacy program. We've got an AI ethics board project office, uh, people that work directly with our business teams and the like. And we are doing more than just compliance from that respect. So from that perspective, we're contributing, you know, sort of indirectly to the privacy as a competitive advantage story, because we have practices that expand across our company and we touch work very closely with the chief data office, with our security teams, et cetera, our legal teams. But we also contribute directly to revenue because we're building the technology that supports our privacy program globally. And we are then working with our product team. So we build it, we test it, we know what works for us to sort of discover what data is out there, to be able to 
understand and comply with something like, you know, China Pitbull in 90 days. You don't have any more of this two, three years like we did with GDPR. You've got to react very quickly. So as Susan said, you have to understand what data you have, where it sits, who has access to it. And so the technology that we build in our privacy program and in support of that is essentially doing that, enabling that. And then we share it with the product teams so that we'll be doing things like creating a personal information taxonomy. And we then use that as a knowledge accelerator in our software products, like our cloud pack for data. So that's been something that's been one of the most interesting parts of my job and our operations, sort of translating those learnings, developing the technology, and then working with the product teams to not only get it incorporated into products, but being able to tell that story to other privacy teams and the like from other companies, from client companies to say, here's how it works for us. Here are the capabilities. We know it works because we use it. And I think that's a real direct value add to the company in the end. What initiatives have you received value from? And do you use any metrics to measure success regarding data privacy and governance over at Allstate, Courtney? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have the traditional metrics that everyone would expect, you know, how, you know, what, how many privacy incidents we have or issues that we have to look at, what the criticality of those are, how quickly, if we have an open compliance issue, are we able to solve it? All of those type of traditional metrics. So we certainly do that. And those are statistics that are looked at really in those trends really carefully with the board of directors, um, the audit committee in our case, in particular oversees data privacy. But what we've sort of taken another level is saying, okay, there are, there are initiatives that we need to do that are either embedding culturally or areas where we think we have opportunity to do things differently to Susan and Christina's point, where you're really leaning into what I would call more embedded privacy by design or early strategic advice, either by privacy engineers or others. We we've had some inorganic growth. So mergers and acquisitions, and those have your challenges because you have companies that have different maturity frameworks for compliance. They have different cultural expectations. They may have had different stages of their company. Because you come to an all state that's been around for 90 plus years, it's been heavily regulated. We lean into kind of loving compliance and lawyers. Never worked at a company like that, by the way. It's awesome. But you know, as you sort of buy companies that have different cultural frameworks, or they've had different investments for reasons that maybe they weren't in the past, even those particular laws or regulations weren't even applicable to their business before they became an all-state company. But yet, you know, you don't want to ruin a business that you purchased. You purchased a business because you thought it was doing great things for customers. Another framework that we created was called personal information anonymization framework. Again, a, an initiative, if you will, of a cross-functional group that said, hey, maybe the best way to protect customers is really to anonymize as much data as you can and make sure that it's not able to be identified to the person because there are things that you need data for, but you certainly want to protect the consumer. What is probably most interesting now is trying to learn from others on where they've been able to come up with more creative ways to measure success and to add value. And we've had some of those and we continue to learn from, from other companies that are, that are trying to do the right thing. Susan, obviously Warner Brothers has merged uh, recently with Discovery. Just wondering if any of that has changed now with the, with the new uh, merger. Well, I think we have a lot of the same issues that Courtney had raised with uh, integrating different business approaches. And I think this isn't unique to Warner Brothers or Discovery. I think a lot of businesses treated privacy in a very bespoke way for each of the business clients they serve. They created privacy policies, they created contract terms, they created processes that serve that unique business. I think for larger companies that are dealing with what we've been talking about, a constantly changing regulatory and industry environment, because the industry rules are changing all of the time too, you really have to think about privacy through a lens of scalability. And I think scalability being global contract terms, global policies, global processes, systems for tracking all of these things. And what I view as like one of our secret weapons is a team of privacy professionals that are not lawyers, but who are serving a really important function of translating legal advice into technical requirements that the technology teams can go build the solutions for. I think that has been super critical, especially for a company like ours that has many, many, many different types of businesses. I mean, we run one of the 
most visited websites in the world, CNN. We have a streaming product that we're now trying to merge, Discovery Plus and HBO Max. We are one of the largest movie studios in the in the world. And all of those businesses are very, very different. And when you look globally, they're all very different. But that doesn't mean that our compliance posture can't sort of work for all of them and work with a view towards where the company's headed, which is thinking of data as an asset. And that that data is an asset that helps fuel better personalized customer experiences in our products, fuels more targeted marketing. So we're spending dollars more wisely when we're buying advertisements to get you in to see the latest movie or to tell you about the launch of the latest game we're producing. And also to fuel an advertising business that's becoming much more important for our products like CNN or for AVOD in our streaming services. So I think that scalability is probably the most important thing. To talk about that in a more granular level and from a legal perspective, we are thinking about that uh, for our contracts because there is no way to remediate contracts as often as regulators would like you to. But the reality is the latest data transfer rules coming out of Europe, the latest requirements in California require us to touch vendor agreements for thousands of vendors. And that is extremely expensive and hard to do at scale. We have found, I think, a way to do that, but I would rather be spending my team's limited resources in thinking about how we make all those changes with minimal amounts of time and effort so that my team can spend the work on the product experiences and working with the technology teams to actually build privacy by design into our systems. Because that's where consumers feel the privacy difference. They don't feel it in the new standard contractual clauses that are included in an addendum to a master services agreement for one of the thousands of vendors that helps us run our business. Just to be a little bit nerdy for a minute. <laughs> Let's finish out that question for Tammy at the World Bank. What initiatives do you receive value from at the World Bank, and, and do you use any metrics to measure success? Given that the World Bank is a very different business model, and just to put it into perspective, our very first policy was adopted May 25th, 2018, and only became effective a year ago, so February of 2021. So this is a brand new law, brand new topic, very few at the bank you know, have any socialization for these concepts. So my initiatives really stem around raising awareness and getting people to buy in. So two of the things that we've done with this decentralized model, my team up until April was three people, tiny team with this huge initiative. So we have very successfully identified and uh, brought under our wing a, a set of privacy focal points. We have 56 primary focal points, but with sub-focal points, about 300. So we have monthly roundtables. We have weekly op open office hours. We use any way that we can to reach out and really train and have our focal points help spread the message. The second thing that I'll highlight is our Data Privacy Day events. My small, smart, scrappy team has now a day and a half of events around January 28th including a privacy educational day with Professor Daniel Solov. And on privacy day itself, we've had Elizabeth Denham, other luminaries in the privacy space participate. And we always have a popular culture or you know, common culture tie in, in order to really try to get our staff to understand what, what we're doing and why we're doing it. And even though we don't have a regulator, why it's important. So our initiatives are really around that awareness raising and training. And yes, we do track metrics and are continuing to build those, build those out as the program starts to really take off. We have the foundation and we're adding more metrics as we go and report those metrics to the audit committee and the board. Can you discuss the importance of automating the decision-making processes around these privacy policies? With Automation, it really comes down to, to two things. One is scaling, which we talked about, but scaling with precision, right? The ability to scale your privacy program globally across your operations. And then the second is ensuring that you can drive evidence-based compliance. So how do you put your hands on data that's needed to verify and validate? 
compliance with a particular regulation or a regulatory request. We do that in a number of ways. We have a privacy information management system, which is an inventory of all the assets and records of processing across the company. And this enables us to automate delivery and track the privacy assessments. It also enables us to highlight high risk areas that need a deeper dive in terms of impact assessment. One of the things we do is essentially to apply metadata across the company, which enables us to have the, to drive data classification. And this enables us to sort of quickly identify what data we have, where it's sitting and who has access to it to remediate in cases where remediation is needed and the like. And then finally, for data subject rights requests, you know, we've taken our process and responding to those. We don't get a ton. Uh, we're not a consumer business, but we do get a decent amount and more as time goes on data subject rights requests and the ability to be able to automatically sort of discover data to respond to those requests and to automate workflows and the like around those is another area where automation has been significantly helpful for us. And Courtney, what should data privacy experts pay attention to next? I think what actually what Christina is talking about is probably the most important in many places, which is automating scalability. At our company, we've tried to build in, we call it data, data buddy. It's a, a homegrown tool that's trying to flag for people, whether or not they're coders and developers, depending on where they are in the system, that there's an issue that they should be paying attention to and what the compliance issue is. Again, trying to make it simple while they're doing their daily work, but we're building out a, a, what we consider a more consumer friendly product privacy preference center that will connect with a lot of the different experiences, thinking about privacy as part of your consumer journey. And I think, Susan, you really hit on that, that it is part and parcel to providing products and services that people want. We are very lucky, all of us here, to, to have consumers trust us and to buy our products and services. When somebody asks you to delete me, for example, did you delete them everywhere? Right. Did you really know what that meant? And it's amazing how often in complex companies, that's a tough question to ask, either because of IT debt through mergers and acquisitions or because of different businesses, to Susan's point earlier. And I think we really have to lean in now for companies to put investment in that scalability, that holistic approach, making sure that the consumer understands this is part of their journey with, with each of us. What should data privacy experts pay attention to next? So I think it's one of the companies that has a consumer facing properties and large scale, I think there's several things coming. I think there's more regulation around kids coming. Yeah. And I think the kids space is a place where almost everyone can agree that more needs to be done. But what does that really look like? Will we see age gates on all properties and products? How will we deal with parental verification, which is an extremely tricky area? What is the right balance between kids having access to digital products and also companies not taking advantage of those kids? And, and really, I'm talking about teenagers here. The space between sort of 13 and 18 is, I think, the space we're going to see a lot more regulation. I also think there's much more coming around consent. And what does it really mean to offer your consent? And what are companies doing to allow you ways to withdraw your consent? So I think looking at parity around the ease of data collection and the ability for consumers to have similar controls to opt out of things if they change their mind, if they no longer want to be part of a particular product or services marketing list. Some of that already exists, but I think that there's going to be more and more push to create transparency and optionality that is easy for consumers to exercise those choices. We're seeing some of that in Europe already, and I think the intersection of what is seen as dark patterns, i.e. like, are you creating ability for consumers to really understand how you're collecting their data without serving up very long user interfaces that are confusing, that may contain sort of persuasive language or in other ways dissuade consumers from opting out of data collection. I think there's going to be more and more interest and enforcement in this space. And I think that's primarily because content moderation and the desire to control how platforms are serving up content to you based on algorithms is going to intersect with privacy. It's already starting to happen, but I think there's going to be more and more companies that are going to need to be focused on this. And I think that's both dealing with the AI and ML issues that Christina highlighted, 
but it's more specific to moderation of user generated content controls around that, that I think a lot of companies there just have not invested in, in this space. Great point, Susan. Abby would love to hear your thoughts on what data privacy experts should pay attention to next. In our space, in the international organization space, these organizations that operate completely differently from my peers here, but, you know, we operate in crisis mode very often, whether it's uh, relocating displaced individuals or responding to food crises, as well as the opportunities to fund projects to build bridges and schools and things. But my focus and my hope is that we start to look at the unintended consequences of the data that we collect and making sure it doesn't get into the hands of an oppressive government or some other way that we haven't foreseen, but the data that we're collecting gets misused. So, you know, resettling refugees, if they're escaping from an oppressive government, we need to make sure that anything that we're collecting does not end up hurting individuals unintentionally. Thank you for that, Tammy. And Christine, any other items data privacy experts should pay attention to? You heard a lot today from privacy chiefs, essentially, right? People who are running programs that have for years been very focused on personal information. That being said, this really is more about data and it's becoming more and more about data. So as we're looking at regulation around AI, as we're looking about an increasing focus on data localization, data transfer requirements, on things like non-personal data governance and regulations in that space, the privacy programs can serve as the foundation for governance more broadly around data. And so I think that's really the direction that I see privacy programs moving towards. There is no other mechanism in place in companies that duplicates what we've put in place on the personal information side of things. And the regulation isn't slowing down. So as regulation is getting increasingly more into these areas that go beyond just personal information, or as the definition of personal information gets broader, or as the ability to breach privacy or to make something personal information due to AI and the like can unlock something that might not be personal information in one context, but put it in a broader context. The program of privacy is the place to look. I want to thank you again, everyone. Great session. And my sincere thanks to each of you for joining us today and for sharing your perspective with our community. And now we're going to move over to the live Q&A with our audience, which starts right now. All right. That was a fantastic session. I want to thank all of our speakers uh, for providing that content and context. And also to all of you, we had a, a great, um, great activity in chat today. We're going to try to get to your uh, questions. I see Susan is joining us now. And uh, feel free to post questions in chat if you like. And Susan, I have to say, great, great information you provided today. I love privacy as a strategic asset. Uh, I know you mentioned a little bit about this earlier, but we did get a couple of questions on uh, more about measurement and metrics. Uh, we did get a question from Irvin Rosales, who's a group IT manager over at ANSA, Macau Limited. and uh, Again, you mentioned this earlier, but wondering if you could dig a little deeper on the metrics used by your privacy and data office to measure performance, uh, effectiveness, and value add. Sure. Uh, well, first, David, thank you so much for having me. It was a great panel. Uh, this has been super interesting conversation. I would just say in terms of metrics, we tend to think of metrics in three buckets. So the first being really, what do we need to show regulators? What's a compliance obligation? And for that, it's a, it's a fairly small number of things right now, but very important. We have to track the volume of data subject access and deletion requests uh, that we are receiving and uh, the number of do not sell. And we're publishing that. Uh, on our website, we're maintaining that on a regular basis. We have more metrics coming and more details to produce on the uh, on data retention in the future. Um, and I expect regulators are going to be asking for more metrics. But that's only a tiny portion of it. I think we're also looking for uh, the metrics we can show if we were investigated. So what's the volume of data privacy impact assessments we're, we're collecting? How much data are we managing? What's our processing around that uh, and the like? But I think two of the other areas that, that are probably even more interesting to this audience are how do you show value to the company? 
How do you show value to the company in terms of the privacy work you're doing to drive better use of data across the company and to do it in a more streamlined way? And I think that both goes, at least from our perspective, to how do we uh, how do we actually staff a function internally with the right mix of lawyers, technologists, and compliance people, and leverage outside counsel and consultants on a much less limited basis? So we do a lot on budget and finance tracking to show value and to do comparisons of an insourcing versus outsourcing model. We are also looking uh, at what we can do to streamline things and to do it faster, quicker, cheaper for the company. So how do we get contracts updated on a faster basis? How do we do them at scale? What are the ways we can combine policies and processes? So we have a lot of metrics to reflect that as well. Fantastic. Uh, great comments in, in the chat. I, I really appreciate it. I'd have to say fantastic discussion, outstanding. She had to choose between another uh, number of other events and chose this one. I'm glad she did, and we are too. Thank you so much for joining us. Next question for Courtney. Courtney, great content. Thank you so much for sharing today. Uh, we had another comment um, on, I, rem I recall you mentioning in your session about the anonymization of data and using those as data sets. And there's a, there's a startup out there called Subsalt, and Ben Winokur, one of the founders, sent in a question. They do this. They specialize in uh, creating anonymous uh, data sets and letting companies test on those data sets. So the question is from uh, Ben over at Subsalt. How do you balance the need to expand access to valuable data, both internally and with partners, with all these expanding privacy and data privacy re restrictions and regulations? Yeah, great, great question. I mean, I think a lot of us would say that's kind of what we grapple with every day if we were thinking about how we wake up and what we solve on a daily basis. But I think the, um, the most important way to think about it is to start with the customer. You have to think about the customer, the consumer, and focus your entire approach, your entire data strategy on what the consumer would expect and want. And when you start there, things make a lot more sense as, as you take data and use it. Um, obviously, one of, one of the things that's important to remind people is that data is powerful. It does have really important uses to, to create better products and services for customers. An example is sometimes you can make things cheaper for a customer. Sometimes you can make things easier to, to work with, which, by the way, we all need more hours in the day. So if we can make a product or service that gives you some time back, that's all the better, right? It could be that we are able to use data to make something that's more personal to you, that feels like it's a product for you rather than the masses. These are all things that customers tell us they want. And I think all of us um, on the panel would say that even in all of our different industries, that's the case. And so we definitely need to understand that there's this powerful use of data out there that really matters to customers. By the same token, no customer, no consumer wants to feel that's at the expense of privacy. They don't. They're not willing to make that trade-off. And that is our job, since they've entrusted it to us, to make sure that we're able to enable that great service, those great products and services, without making it the expense of, um, of privacy. And there's a lot of different ways. All the companies have talked about um, that in the, in the course of the panel. But one way is to think about how you structure your company and make sure that you aren't siloing how you look at privacy. So privacy really needs to be ubiquitous. You need people with eyes and ears throughout your company. You cannot have lawyers, for example, or compliance professionals as the only ones that wake up and think about this. If that's the case in any complex company, you'll fail. You need to have everybody thinking about it and you need it as part of their job. And, um, and really understanding the culture that it's not about what you can do, it's about what you should do for the customer. And when you make that change in your company and you think about that and you embed it in the way that you operationalize all of your businesses, um, it really helps. I mean, a small example is a lot of people can't write out my title and I hate that it's so long, but it's got a bunch of different components to it. Right. And it's not just privacy officer, right, David? It's, I also sit in, and I'm a general counsel for all of our non-insurance businesses. So I, you know, I wake up and I think about business issues all day not just compliance, because otherwise dots are not connected. And I'm just one of many people that connect the dots for the company is certainly many more in all different roles. But, um, but I think thinking about how you're structured and it's not always about adding FTEs and cost and all of that. Sometimes it's really about just reformulating how people prioritize their work, what they're expected to look for, um, what your, your culture is ethically and how it applies to data. Um, but 
you know, there's there's a lot of different strategies. I know many have, have um, brought up others, but I, I would say, you know, start with the customer. Always start with the customer and it all makes it much easier. Definitely. And great point about the titles. Uh, this was a challenge to put everyone's titles, you know, <laughs> under their name because everyone's was so long, but you're right about the points in there. Like, you know, Christina with the AI ethics board chair at IBM, in addition to being key privacy officer, look mm -hmm. at Tom's title, same thing, ethics is in there. And I think it's so critical, not only with ethics and also AI, because the regulations keep coming up, uh, the importance of having people focused on these issues at their organization. So, so really great points. Thank you so much. And on this note, the next question is for Tammy, and I'm going to shift gears a little bit because, you know, it's fantastic when we get such a diverse panel with people from so many different industries because the perspectives you all gave was so enlightening, I think, to so many of our viewers out there. But in addition, we had four female CPOs and, and somebody asked me, you know, how diverse is the CPO title? Are they all women? <laughs> and uh, no, we, we were just very lucky that you all joined us today. Uh, it is a very competitive space as well. So I note with delight that we've had four female CPOs on this panel. And Tammy, I was wondering, because I saw that you are a member of Chief uh, on your title uh, in, in your LinkedIn background. Uh, we always strive for diversity. You know, I worked, uh, I incubated the CDO club at an executive search firm that focused, uh, Janice Elling, the Elling group that focuses on getting women into C-suites and onto boards. And I noticed Chief does some of the same things. So I was just wondering, if you or uh, or Courtney or, or Liliana could provide any networks or suggest any networks or provide any tips for other female executives who are striving to enter the C-suite or join boards or become a non-executive director. Sure. I um, thank you for that question, and I'm happy to promote uh, Chief, which is a, a private ne membership network that um, supports and connects female executive leaders, um, wow. both in large companies, startups, and across all industries. So there's, I think there are about 10,000 members right now, and it's growing by leaps and bounds. And it provides large group presentations. Uh, last night, I got to listen to Amy Poehler um, speak about her experiences. That was delightful. Um, and then there are small core groups where we, uh, we can coach and encourage each other and help problem solve. And then there are different interest groups. So there's a new group on privacy that was just established, but there are groups on industry and personal perspectives. So highly, highly, highly recommend um, Exploring Chief for one of these experiences. Great. And thank you so much for your perspective and your comments today, Tammy. You really gave us so much uh, diverse viewpoints from, from the World Bank. And I have to give a shout out to Eileen Verdreen, who just mentioned in the comments that we should give a, a shout out to women leaders in data and AI. Uh, Eileen, and we, we gave the CDO and the CAO of the Year Award uh, last year. Eileen was the Chief Data Officer of the Year Award winner. And Sol Rashidi, we gave the Chief Analytics Officer of the Year Award. She's over at uh, uh, Estee Lauder. She used to be at Merck. And uh, thanks, Eileen, for mentioning that both of our CDO and CAO award winners were both members of Women in Data. <laughs> so thanks for that shout out in the comments, Eileen. And we'll see Eileen in Boston. I see she's registered for our event. Our events are going to be live from this point on. Uh, no more virtual events this year. We've got a live event in San Francisco coming up uh, on November uh 9th and uh, the uh, IBM event in Boston will be December, Tuesday, December 6th. Uh, so with that, with a couple minutes left, uh, Interpol, we have a couple of minutes. We can wrap up with Liliana or did you have any closing thoughts? No, just a tremendous uh, panel. And thank you all very much for being here. I really enjoyed listening to all the different perspectives. Uh, you know, the, the, the industries that you come from were so different uh, that we got a real flavor of what this means across industries. So just uh, couldn't be more thankful. I think uh, the, the aspects of technology and the relationship between data and privacy, uh, you know, uh, Christina Montgomery summarized that really well as well, that those two departments are so close. I mean, sometimes I joke with Christina, I don't know where her area begins and mine ends and so forth. You know, we have to partner very closely to get things done. And you saw the same aspect being brought out by the other panelists as well. So a tremendous panel. I think there was one question in the chat, uh, Dave, that we didn't pick up on. I'm not sure, but I thought there was maybe one, but uh, otherwise uh, I think I'm good to 
wrap up. Fantastic. We'll try to get to everybody's questions in chat subsequent to this. And with that, uh, what a great session. Again, thank you all so much for participating and especially to everybody who joined in the chat. Let's send it over to Liliana to wrap it up. Perfect. What a great session. And a special thanks to all our speakers and to everyone who joined us today. Our sincere hope is that you leave today with additional knowledge and also practical steps to generate a strategic approach to data privacy. I'm excited to announce, as Dave mentioned, that IBM CDO CTO Strategy Summit will again be live in person in San Francisco on Wednesday, November 9, and in Boston on Tuesday, December 6. We will bring thought leaders and respected colleagues with a full agenda of relevant topics, such as data strategy, data fabric, data governance and privacy, and much more. Be sure to register, and we are posting the links in our chat. Cannot wait to see you there. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you in San Francisco.